let us go and start our main session, which will be the panel uh, discussion session. And here I would like to invite Professor Alistair Rickrack from the North Hungary University, who will be chairing this panel session. Uh, the Alistair uh, is, I think many of you know, uh, he's a very well known scholar in this field. And also he is the module coordinator for this MOOC on uh, module three on international water law. Um, you see his uh, profile in detail. Uh, now you see on the screen, this, uh, this is actually on the website that I, I, I mentioned to you. So I won't go into the detail. And, uh, but let's see, uh, he, his fun fact is that Alistair lives near St. Andrews, where the home of the Gulf and place of five handicap. So, Alistair, please, the um, floor is yours. Thanks, Yumiko. I won a golf competition at the weekend, so now it's four. I just think that's, that's an important information. <laughs> Morning, uh, afternoon, evening, everyone. Uh, great to be with you. Thanks a lot for participating in this, uh, in this event. Um, it's great to see um, such, such good support and, and, and brilliant to have um, a wonderful uh, set of panelists joining us. Um, I'll ask each panelist to, to introduce themselves. Um, we'll go around and then, and then in the second round, we'll ask them to address the, the, the questions that you submitted in advance. So I won't, I won't introduce the, the, the panelists myself. Um, I'll just say a, a little bit, Yumiko introduced me, so I don't have to say much there. I just, just generally say my research interests are around how do we make transboundary water arrangements better? And I think, you know, there are so many good examples. Uh, it's interesting to say, you know, we were all quite positive about transboundary water cooperation working. So many great examples of that where these agreements are actually in place um, and working and working well. And, and maybe we don't hear enough about that. Um, we focus a bit on, on the more, more challenging ones. Um, but the, certainly my interest is to to look more at how we how we make these these treaties better but that's that's enough from me so i'm going to pass over first to professor patricia wouters um she had a number of questions there were a number of questions around transboundary water cooperation basically um and and she'll address those but but first um i'll ask her um to quickly introduce herself and her uh, say a little bit about her perspective on international water law. Over to you, Pat. Okay. Um, is that okay? Is that slide okay? Okay, good. Oh, I'm so happy. I'm uh, I'm so happy to be here. I can't tell you. Um, first, I want to say. Um, Thank you very much, Dr. Yumiko, and thank you very much, Professor Ali, and thank you very much, fellow panelists. It's just uh, uh, amazing uh, to be here. I'd like to say um, just a few words about myself and then kick off with, with uh, about three points on why I think international water law is important. Um, first, uh, I am currently founding director of a new global initiative at the, in Wuhan. It's the International Water Law Academy. Um, I'll be saying more about that later. I've got 30 years or more um, experience in international water law, uh, including founding the first international water law center in Dundee. Many of you, uh, I looked at the list, many of you have been to Dundee. Uh, it's uh, wonderful to see so many um, old friends and so many new friends. I've done a lot of research on international law and international water law and done expert advice to the UN, World Bank, and regional bodies. And I'm delighted uh, to be back after a little hiatus, a little taking a little time out. I'd like to close just this, um, before I get into my three points by saying how proud I am of the leadership on this international water law module by three former students from Dundee. And that's Dr. Yumiko, Professor Ali, and of course, Dr. Ganara. So wonderful to have you here. Now, my three points, one, Communities. I think international water law is really important because of the communities it helps to build, 
um, through multi levels of governance within and beyond the water course, through technical and academic and other communities, through horizontal and vertical uh, crossovers. But what I'd like to do is I would like to ask, I would like to ask the audience, how do you think international water law helps to build communities that are important for transboundary water? That's my first point, Ali. I'm going quickly. Number two, communication. I'm going with the three C's here. Communication. I think international water law helps with communication across a basin. It provides a framework for how we speak and what we speak about. It provides a language and also uh, provides the discourse parameters. So my question really to all of you is how does international law help with communication in a way that promotes transboundary water co cooperation? So it's a question to the audience. And my third question is cooperation. I think that international water law helps uh, to build transboundary water cooperation, not only from through the normative duty of the duty to co cooperate um, through substantive and procedural norms, but also by helping to make cooperation effective and meaningful at a number of levels. And I think the foundation for that alley, as we all know, is equitable and reasonable use. And I think Cooperation is also about fairness across across the basin. So those are my three points, Ali. I just wanted to put it out there and ask uh, the participants, because we do want this to be interactive, how can international water law meet the three C's? So that's enough about me. I want to know about you. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Pat. Um, and just a reminder that everyone can put their um, questions into the, the poll -y. Um, so let me now pass on to our next part, uh, next panelist, which is um, Dr. Dinara Ziganshina. Thank you very much. Uh, greetings from Central Asia to all. Very happy to be with you. Uh, my name is Dinara Ziganshina. I am working for Joint Bodies in Central Asia. It's the Scientific Information Center of Interstate Commission for Water Coordination. And I have a legal background and did PhD on international law and transboundary waters under the supervision of Professor Wouters. So thank you very much for all knowledge I received. And I'm practicing international law and also teaching international law. And by this background and my practice on Central Asia, I do believe that international law matters. And I, I think if you ask why, I think um, it, it's really a system that provides the frame for repairing countries, for repairing states and international actors to maintain peace and order. And here I would just like to emphasize one point. It's important for us to fulfill our task as a community, here's again to task reference, to develop, apply and implement international law. It will not help and resolve our task if we will not, as a community, apply. So thank you very much. Brilliant. Thanks, Dinara. Um, so next on my list, I have Professor Owen McIntyre. Mike. Sorry. OK, I have it. Alistair, thank you very much. And uh, thank you. Um, uh, Yumiko for the opportunity to participate in this uh, excellent event. Um, my name is Owen McIntyre. I teach environmental law. Um, I have done for uh, about 30 years now, uh, the last 20 years um, uh, in my home country in Ireland. For much of that time, my key research interest is in the area of international water law, but specifically in the environmental protection of international water courses uh, and more and more on ecosystems protection and the ecosystems approach to the management of water courses. But uh, related to that, I have an interest in procedural engagement and cooperation um, and uh, human rights uh, approaches to water and sanitation, uh, access to water and sanitation services. I also work as a consultant in the area of international water law. I currently have two projects in Southern Africa, one in East Africa and um, one uh, global project. Um, 
I suppose in, in the last 20 or more years, I've watched international water law evolving and actually evolving quite quickly in, in international law terms uh, with the, the entry into force of the UN Water Courses Convention, the going global of the UNEC Water Convention. Um, so, you know, and, and particular uh, developments of interest to me uh, in relation to ecosystems protection, the, the uh, case law that is developed around that area and in the area of procedural engagement has been of great interest. I suppose the key message I'd want to get across is that if, uh, as Professor Wooders and as uh, Dinara has, has mentioned, if international law provides a tool or tools for effective cooperation and communication, both at the interstate level and at uh, other levels involving communities and civil society, et cetera, it's very important that they continue to evolve. It's very important that we engage with them. It's only by engagement with these tools that they will evolve and better suit our needs. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Owen. So next on my list is Dr. Kalis Tindi Mugaya. Um, I should say that uh, Kalist is the only um, non non lawyer on our panel, so thank you for being so brave to 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 join us. But but I know you have such a huge experience um, in in negotiating and implementing uh, water agreements. So so it's great to have you with us. Please over to you. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, I would like first of all to thank the organizers, Professor Alistair and Dr. Yumiko for inviting me to be part of, of the panel. As you have rightly said, I'm the only non-water lawyer on the panel. <laughs> and I'm happy, of course, to learn from the international water lawyers, but also to see how we are utilizing international water law in practice. So basically, I'm involved in the application side of international water law. I work for the Ministry of Water and Environment in Uganda as the head of the Department for Water Resources Planning and Regulation. I also coordinate capacity building program in the Nile Basin International uh, Integrated Water Resources Management. But more recently, I've been involved in promoting transboundary water cooperation at the basin as our basin level. And that's where international water law has been very useful in our work. Of course, in whatever we do, we always refer to the principles of international water law so that we can get cooperation on the ground happening. International water law is helping us provide guidance on how we are going to cooperate, how we are going to secure water resources, and how we can ensure that we have benefits from the shared water resources. We have been having a program between Uganda and Kenya where we are bringing transboundary water cooperation to the ground where the common people, the ordinary people are also participating and we're already seeing benefits. So one thing we are trying to advocate for is to move transboundary water cooperation from the high levels to the lower level so that the ordinary people can feel it and appreciate it. Thank you very much. Fantastic, thank you, Kalist. And last, last but certainly not least, um, can I hand over to our, our final panelist, which is uh, Professor Gong Lingji. Thank you, Ali. I'm also very happy and, and pleased and honored um, to be invited to join this event. And as you can see from my profile, I'm a professor of international law um, at the International, law, uh, international Water Law Academy at Wuhan University. And my research has a focus on uh, international dispute settlement, especially uh, uh, settlement of transboundary water dispute. So I look forward to more in-depth discussion um, with the panelists and other participants on, um, on settlement of those disputes uh, and also um, the jurisprudence as developed by the, um, the courts and tribunals in the settlement of uh, the dispute. Uh, the question um, put forward by uh, this event is, does the world need more international water law? I'm so happy to see it. it's like 80% um, of the, uh, <laughs> the participant of the view, we do need more international water law, but I would like to put the question uh, in a, another way. 
Uh, we all know we have plenty of uh, international law, the convention, uh, the customary rules, uh, the general international law, and uh, jurisprudence. So the question probably should be, uh, be put as uh, why uh, and how? Uh, what, why do we need more and what kind of law do we need um, um, in this new, um, new era? So with that, I will you know, pass it back to Ali. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Ling Jin. So I think, uh, yeah, I, I like how the panelists have posed lots, lots of more questions. <laughs> so so the, the participants have, have, uh, have got their work cut out, but, but I also see from our, our poll that we're getting lots of questions in. So that's, so that's brilliant. So without further ado, what, what I'll do now is I'll turn to um, each of the panelists um, to address some of the pre-submitted questions. Um, that we had, and I think um, you'll see the you'll see the um, questions come up um, on the on the group chat. Um, we sort of clumped together related questions, and and to be efficient with the time, asked each panelist to 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 address um, certain topic areas of questions. So so as I mentioned before, the first the first on the list are, are basically a number of questions that that relate to, to international water law. And transboundary water cooperation, and, and you can see them there on the on the chat now. Um, so I'll pass over to to Professor Wouters to please um, please uh, address these um, uh, as as briefly as you can. <laughs> okay. Okay, Ali. Um, uh, I guess I'm okay, Ali. I get, my questions. I had a list. I, I've got about eight pre questions on, and I think they're all grouped around international water law and cooperation. So the duty to cooperate, and what role for international law? I agree with my colleague Professor Kong. I think the question is why and how. And as I outlined, I think if you just think about international cooperation or cooperation yourselves on a river basin, how does cooperation really work? Yes, international law provides a normative framework. Well, yes, it provides uh, procedural guidance on how to do that, but it really is about people. So how do we bet, build communities, communities of interest uh, on the basin at all of the levels, you know, so we've got uh, vertical integration and across uh, the horizon of riparian interest. So, from an international law point of view, I think the most important element, uh, Ali and, and, and fellow panelists and colleagues in the field, is that we move toward meaningful engagement, meaningful cooperation. And if you look at how things work in life and how things have changed over this past year, cooperation and international cooperation is hard. So we have to be prepared for the long game. We have to be invested in building communities at all levels. And we have to see how we better communicate so that we can find a base for cooperation. Thanks, Ali. I think that's all I'll say right now. I'm happy to say a lot more. Um, mostly, uh, maybe at the end when I talk about the Wuhan Academy and our aspirations on cooperation. Long, hard, but worth it. Thank you. Great, thanks. Thanks very much um, for that. And I can see we have some some more questions in the in the poll um, uh, related to that. So so I'm sure we'll come back to 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 um, this this meaningful cooperation and 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 how we how we put that in practice. So the next questions are are to Dr. Zigan Schiner, um, which which broadly relate to um, I would say data sharing. Um, and and um, and enforcement. So um, I'll pass over to to Dinara. Thank you very much, Alistair. Indeed, my question relates to da data sharing. And one of those, if data and information sharing has to be mandatory, and how? And I think it's quite straightforward answer. Yes, but we have to be very clear on what kind of information has to be exchanged. It's a readily available data and information concerning international water quality. Countries have to do their best to exchange this data and they can choose different channels. It can be direct 
uh, communication or it can be through joint bodies. And this second kind of set of question that I see here, it relates to enforcement. And um, it's kind of very important question in international law and enforcement I would say disability of international law, it's a very hot topic everywhere, given that every day we hear from the news and media how countries violate international law, sanction, etc. And it's unfortunate that we hear much less about everyday successes of international law, how international law is good in putting our lives in order, enabling a uh, prosperity of life for us, peace and security. I think we have to, it's our role as a lawyers also to, to make it more prominent about the successes of international law, not setting ahead um, aside, I'm sorry, uh, the enforcement. But for, for non-legal audience here, enforcement is the existence of um, uh, sanctions or any other material consequences in the event of non-compliance with international law? And the most straightforward answer would be yes. The legal traditional response is the law of state responsibility and dispute settlement system, courts, arbitration, etc. But I think it would be more relevant to talk, especially in the environmental and uh, water-related field, to talk about more innovative and promising avenue of preventing non-compliance and helping in implementation. Because most of the time, countries are having difficulties in implementing and complying with their treaty obligations. And here, I would be a really advocate for UNEC Water Convention. I think it's one of the greatest avenue, as uh, Professor Waters mentioned, of community of interest of the countries to together do something in order to improve transboundary water situation in the basin. And they have quite a unique mechanism is the implementation committee. I'm very proud to serve for this committee. And I think it's a um, mechanism where countries can apply if they have difficulties in implementing the convention or their obligations when the experts from this different discipline can help countries to come up with the joint solution. It's not that expert panel decide for them. They bring countries together to decide what's happening. And the third point that I want to mention is about the importance of joint bodies. I think it's really paramount importance of have very effective joint body that can prevent disputes and help to resolve them. So thank you. Fantastic. Um, thank you. Thank you, Danara. Um, next, next on our list, we have um, Professor Oren McIntyre. Um, and we had we had a number of questions again, just to remind you that they'll come up in the chat um, that but broadly relate to the environment, ecosystem protection and international law and um, and and also the link between law and science. So so I'll pass over to Owen to please address those. Thank you, Alistair. Um, there were four questions, so I have around 30 seconds each. I'll, I'll be as quick as I can. Um, the first related to the question of environmental personhood for international rivers, which is very much tied up with the issue of rights uh, of nature. And to be honest, I'm not entirely convinced by this uh, paradigm or by this development, because I'm not sure it, it grants a great deal more than enhanced legal standing for certain actors. So despite claims for that paradigm, it remains you know, centrally anthropocentric. Um, it, it, you require human guardians. There's a danger of creating a monopoly on standing for particular uh, 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 guardians with particular interests. Um, questions remain about, is it more effective to protect particular features, um, you know, rivers or species or glaciers, rather than protect nature in general? That undermines, if you do so, it undermines the interrelationship uh, of ecosystems, and I would be concerned about that. I would recommend somebody reads Oliver Hook's article from 2017 in the Tulane uh, Environmental Law Journal, and he talks about uh, this approach, you know, demonstrating honesty, um, the, the uh, being important for the interpretation of environmental law, you know, 
stressing enhancement and restoration of nature, uh, creating due process, a seat at the table for nature, and raising awareness. But these are political aims rather than legal functions. But often, you know, rights discourse has a political function as much as legal. The second question was about protecting biotic elements in uh, the watershed. And again, I would be concerned here about interconnectedness. You know, we should think about biotic and abiotic elements. When we think about a definition of ecosystems, we're looking at the entire picture, biotic and abiotic. Um, we're looking at ecosystem structure and function. And international water law is developing tools around this on environmental flows, adaptive management, still in its infancy, ecosystem services, this paradigm, and payments for ecosystem services, facilitating greater benefit sharing, all of which requires greater cooperation through you know, river basin organizations or other institutional frameworks. There was a question on forests and deforestation and their importance. And I think deforestation as damage has always been recognized. If you go back to the work of McCaffrey, commentaries to uh, the, the uh, ILC draft articles from 1994, I think even in the Helsinki, uh, to the Helsinki rules of commentary uh, uh, alludes to deforestation. Um, I think the, the, um, the statements, judicial statements from the San Juan River cases are very helpful here about uh, uh, harm to ecosystems and loss of ecosystem services to ensure that uh, forests can be, can be incorporated and included. And the last question was about scientific knowledge and particularly hydrology and its incorporation into international water law. The, the development of the UN Water Courses Convention was a low point because it went with water course rather than basin, but that was a political decision. It wasn't really a, a fault of, of the legal process. It was you know, laws made by politicians, unfortunately. Um, at the same time, the UN Water Courses Convention you know, stressed ecosystems. We've had the development of uh, the ecosystems approach, which really is based on science. Um, the, uh, if we look at the, the International Law Commission draft articles on transboundary aquifers, they're more based on, on hydrological realities. Um, the, today, international water law is grappling with, with climate change impacts, which again are, are driven by the science. And a number of people have talked about you know, institutional cooperation. Uh, Dr. Diganshina, uh, or Ziganshina talked about uh, data sharing. Institutional cooperation really is about developing a shared understanding and you know, a communication of scientific facts you know, amongst the parties and other actors. And these scientific facts relate to you know, conditions, including hydrological conditions, risks, impacts, mitigation of those risks, et cetera. So the science is, is intrinsically central to international water law, but becoming more central through improvements in communication. Sorry, Alistair, taking more time than I should. Brilliant, and uh, no need to apologize. That was great. And uh, you did well to address those uh, questions in such a short time, but, but in a nice way. Um, let me now turn to uh, Dr. Khalees. So we have, um, we had a number of questions again coming up in the chat, which essentially um, relate to implementation uh, uh, and, and examples of that. So, so I'll hand over to you. Um, if you could address those questions, that would be great. Okay, thank you very much, Ali. And uh, I try to respond to these questions. The first one was on the gaps that are threatening implementation of fresh water hicks and rose in East Africa. Number one, uh, I can say that there is generally raw awareness of the importance and benefits of transboundary cooperation. So countries will always ask themselves, why should we bother about these roads that are uh, put in place to govern shared water resources? So the awareness and the benefits. And we also need, uh, I think there hasn't been much demonstration of the benefits of transboundary cooperation. So countries look at it as really a talk show, but there is the need to do more on the ground. The other issue is stakeholders involvement. Traditionally, it has been government business and the ordinary people really don't understand what you are discussing. The other issue is limited capacity and the transboundary water resources management, but also international water. Some of these, again, people don't really know much about them. They hear about them. So my view is that to address this challenge, we need to put in place multi-stakeholder platforms that will enable us to have basin-wide water resources development and planning 
where all the key stakeholders are involved. And we have tried to do this kind of work on the ground between Uganda and Kenya. We have a basin that we share, it is called Sio Marava Marakisi Basin, where we are bringing the two countries, first of all, to look at the benefits and opportunities for transboundary water cooperation. We, are, we brought the stakeholders together, we created my stakeholder committees, and we identified the challenges that the two countries are faced with. For example, we are faced with flooding, limited development, pollution, catchment degradation, and the countries now came together to identify what benefits they can get by working together, but what the opportunities really exist. We have been able to develop the CEO Maraba Marakisi investment framework. We have identified priority projects and we have clustered those projects into four major projects, which are benefiting the two countries. And right now the two countries are actually selling them within the countries and with the donors so that we get funding. But we have also been able to put in place a structure that brings the two countries together and the most important part of that is we are having the people on the ground to be part of that committee. From the national level up to the community level, and through that we are seeing that people are realizing that working together will enable them to actually benefit as they manage these water resources. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kaliste, and thanks for sharing us. Yeah, it's such a great example, um, the, the SMM Basin and, and that link cooperation taking place at multiple levels from the community um, to, to, the, to the national. Um, so it's thanks, thanks a lot for sharing that. Um, so we're, we're at um, Professor, Professor Kong, we have um, a, a couple more questions that pre-submitted questions um, for you to address, um, which essentially um, relate to International, international water law and, and links with other areas of law. Um, and also um, this question of bilateral agreements, you know, the, the relationship between basin, basin and bilateral agreements. So, so I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Ali. Um, I'm so happy, you know, to be given a privilege to respond to only two very specific questions. <laughs> Uh, and now, now first, uh, the first question goes like, uh, um, are there any other international law that can complement international water law for uh, transboundary water cooperation? Uh, a quick answer is yes. Uh, uh, we all know there are plenty of um, other sections of international law, environmental uh, law, the law of the sea, um, the law of um, international human rights and state responsibility and et cetera. Um, but I would like to emphasize here um, how international law works. When you turn to uh, a dispute settlement, for example, uh, one repairing state alleged uh, the other had breached certain obligations, they may first go to uh, turn to uh, international water law to see whether um, the other party should bear or undertake a, a certain uh, obligation. But after that, you can see international water law alone cannot settle the dispute at all. They need to turn to other um, uh, area or section of international law, including um, the basic principle or the principles of the law, and also like um, the law on state responsibility. Um, the court or tribunal need to invoke um, principle and rules on um, state responsibility, on um, reparation and compensation for damages. Um, the other question is actually on the uh, Mekong River. Um, should there be a bilateral arrangement um, before any um, meaningful cooperation can be in implemented? Uh, as far as I know, uh, the optim optimum probably will be like, um, uh, for all the uh, reparent dates to um, conclude, you know, uh, a convention or an agreement that covers uh, all the matters relating to use and protection of the whole river basin. 
But the reality on the ground, you know, as we all know, the four um, Mekong River parent states, they have concluded a convention and, and uh, the uh, Mekong River Commission um, were established based on that convention. And China and Myanmar are not, you know, a party to the convention. They are also uh, not um, member to the Mekong River Commission. However, I'm, I'm so happy to see uh, that re very recently, China and, and all the other, the Lan Lantang Mekong River um, our parent states, um, they have reached agreement and, and China also to, to provide uh, all year round hydrology information um, of the Lantang River um, to the uh, Mekong River our parent states. Um, we, you know, look forward to more um, those kind of um, very pragmatic uh, cooperation between China and and uh, the other five apparent states uh, in the future. Thank you, Ali. Fantastic, Linji. Thanks. Thanks very much for for addressing those questions, and and thanks to to all the panelists um, for 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 going through all the all the pre-submitted questions, and 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 we're also. We're also um, good for doing that, and you, you did that well in the, in the allocated time. <laughs> so, so why that's good is that we now have um, uh, an interactive session, um, uh, and this gives us an opportunity to hear from from the participants that are with us um, their questions um, that have been submitted to, through the um, Polev um, and um, and for the um, panelists to to have an opportunity to respond to them um, and what i'll do is I'll, I'll go through them and i'll invite um i'll invite the um panelists to to to, to say something on 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 specific questions um, so the first one um i i think for this one we'll, we'll maybe follow the same order so so that, that the top one we have with the the, the the big question is is um on how to ensure transboundary water regulation, but how to ensure transboundary water regulation between two fighting countries, and and Professor Wooters, I think I'll I'll um, hand hand this one over to you um, if you don't mind. Uh, we've we've had some examples, you know, some examples of 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 good good cases of where where transboundary water cooperation works and it works well. But but what 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 happens when when two countries are uh, uh, I don't know if fighting was, you know, but at least at least have um, serious disagreements. Um, how, how does how does um, international water law play a, a role in that context? So so over to you to answer that one. I think you're on mute. Mute. Okay, here we are. Okay, there you go. Great, great question. And it's something that uh, it's not the first time I've heard this question. Um, I think we have to un unpack the question. And the first layer is um, uh, first, we have to look at international law. And when there is a dispute, as Professor Kong says, if there's a dispute in international water law, we go, we look to see if there's any basis for consent or taking this through a dispute settlement process. So it doesn't mean there has to be a treaty between the two countries on water. You might find another treaty like a treaty of commerce or cooperation, any other treaty might have a foundation for taking the matter to court, to the International Court of Justice or to a tribunal. So from an international legal perspective, say if I was advising one of the countries, I would say, um, do you want to take this through formal dispute settlement? Now, I believe that good international water lawyers don't go to court. Um, I think we would try to see if there is a, uh, some sort of uh, technical or uh, political basis for starting um, discussions or negotiations. And often, I mean, if you look at a lot of the state practice, which we have done and Dundee has done and many of the colleagues on the panel have done, if you look at how disputes have been resolved, generally, if we can find the nib of the problem, 
and maybe have a, a technical, say a technical problem on ecosystem protection, on the quality or quantity of, of uh, water being shared, we can sometimes put it over to the technical people like a river basin organization or a panel of uh, engineers like they do, like they've been doing, you know, for over 100 years on the um, uh, between uh, USA and Mexico, and we try to find a technical solution so that we don't elevate it into a dispute settlement process. So that would be, I think, uh, a preferable approach. Um, but if the countries don't get along, if the countries can't get along, um, then I would say we'd have to elevate it to the rules of international law. And international law means you have to find a basis of consent before you take it, take it to a tribunal or to a court, uh, and we and we go from there. Uh, I would say that the global conventions, you know, the UN, the UNDC Water Water Convention and the UNWC Water Courses Convention, each provide different approaches to how we resolve uh, disputes over water. So I would advise my parties to look at those, whether either of those approaches would help. Uh, but in the first instance, you know, my one of my biggest sayings always has been real international water lawyers don't go to court. So that's what I would say. Unpack the dispute, look at your options, try to find a basis for, to build a community that perhaps could communicate. I mean, you could actually devise a communication platform for engaging uh, the most important people around the table. See if we can find a technical solution and go from there. I hope that I hope that's helped. I hope that's enough. Okay. Fantastic. Yep. Great. Um, let me turn, uh, I think there's a few questions. Let's, let's mix up the order. I'll go to um, Owen, if I may, um, next. Um, and there, there are a number of questions around uh, non-state actors, um, role of, so does the international water law help promote compliance with environmental rights among private sector? Um, how can international law help resolve disputes among non-state actors? Um, uh, I think there was something in the chat as well, which is about transnational corp corporations. Could I ask um, Owen to, to respond to, to those questions, sort of, which all kind of relate to this, where do, where do non-state actors and particularly the private sector fit into um, international water law? Thanks. Thanks, Alistair. Um, I think you raise a very interesting issue at the sort of leading edge of international water law here. I think many of these questions um, uh, relate to this sort of latest wave in development of international water law. We, if we look at, a tr at the traditional paradigm of, of international water law, it fitted within a traditional paradigm of international law, where states were the key actors, and they were, you know, almost sort of removed or hermetically sealed from from uh, non-state actors, but that's less and less and less the case across the entire uh, field of international law and in international environmental and natural resources law, more particularly. So um, we see, for example, yeah, and one of the things, one of the very nice things about, about uh, practice in international law and in any law is that it's not copyrighted. We should learn from each other. You know what I mean? There should be mutual learning amongst organizations and, and you know, as between states and regions. And if we look at, at bodies that show real leadership, like for example, the, the practice under the UNEC Water Convention, the way the convention engages, you know, it, it, all its, its deliberations are open, it engages with civil society actively, positively, and in a systematic and structured manner. And I think that's becoming increasingly common in, you know, where we have sophisticated institutional cooperation. Um, so, Non-state actors play a particularly significant role uh, in any projects that I've worked in, you know, recently in international water law. The key element has been stakeholder consultation, uh, you know, very, very detailed structures to ensure that we're, that we're engaging in meaningful stakeholder consultation and identifying key stakeholders, governmental, non-governmental, private sector, etc. So I think that's already happening. The, at a more um, uh, normative level, you know, International water law provides a framework for uh, uh, the development of values, the development and the normativi normativization of values, which will inevitably impact on the rights of, of individuals, 
on you know the the uh, obligations imposed upon uh, private sector actors, including transnational corporations. And um, if you look at just take the example of the emergence of the human right to water and sanitation, you know international water law had already identified vital human needs as being you know the critical sort of uh, super factor, if you like, in in any any uh, determination of equitable and reasonable utilization. It had already broken the ground in terms of those values. We look now at, at you know, uh, it's becoming increasingly clear that the kind of protection to investors, to, to uh, 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 overseas investors that had been provided by um, international investment law will have to be tempered by the realities of environmental, international environmental law, international water law, et cetera. That, so the, the clear development, the elaboration, um, the, the, um, the clarification, if you like, of those values has a significant impact for the obligations of private sector actors. There's no question about that, but that's becoming more and more and more obvious. And the routes by which it can happen are becoming clearer. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Owen. Um, Professor Kung Ling Ji, we, um, we asked you to answer some very specific questions um, during the first round. So I wonder if, 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 if you might address this, the second, the second priority one on the, on the poll, EV, which is, uh, which is, is, is a broader question. Um, and it's on the future. Um, what does the future hold for Transbrandy Waters? And, and, and so, so where would you, and particularly given you know, that this is, a, this is a, a, an event on international water law, where, where do you see um, the future of uh, international water law? How, how do you see it um, progressing? Thanks, Ali. This is, yeah, indeed, a very broad uh, question. Um, let me try to answer this question. I, I think um, um, for, for international law in general and uh, um, international water law in particular um, need to evolve, you know, by adapting to the um, changing context, changing situation um, facing the international community. Let me give you a very specific example. Owen, um, Professor Owen McIntyre just to touch upon um, the principle of, um, or, or the, uh, the special um, uh, regard to be given to vital human needs um, as prescribed in the UN Water Quality Convention. And we all know that include drinking water. Um, but, but now when we look at, think about um, the uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals, uh, 6.5 6 on water and sanitation, we need to think about uh, the access to water by, um, the local communities um, um, in Africa and in the rainforest in Latin America, how could they have um, access um, to drinkable water and, and more? You know, not probably just not, not just about water, um, not just about drinking water. Think about their livelihood. Um, uh, we talk a lot about sustainable development, but we seem to forget about. Uh, development, we focus too much on sustainable, you know. <laughs> um, I watched a documentary about the case, walking um, um, seven days and night um, with his father um, to cross um, the rainforest so that he can go to school. And, and then on the seventh day, they um, went before in front of um, a river and due to the rain, they cannot cross the river. So they have to return to their home, walk for another seven days and nights and cannot go to school. So I think about, you know, think when I think about this um, kind of things, um, we probably need to um, reinterpret um, the provision, the rules we already have um, in the convention. Uh, what, what does vital human need means? Should we include um, something more, you know, expand the scope and, um, how to implement such um, um, uh, such a principle in practice, especially um, when we think about implementation of the UN SDGs. Thank you, Ali. Brilliant, thanks, thanks, Ling Ji. And, and yeah, I think that's a really great point in terms of reinterpreting and and yeah, but these the 
international water law, these treaties are, are, are not set in stone, but they are um, constantly being reinterpreted um, in light of um, uh, changing, changing situations. Um, Dr. Kalist, I think if I may, I'll, I'll come to you. Um, you, also, you, you already um, gave us this um, nice example of the Sio Malaba Malakisi um, basin, and there are a number of questions uh, on the on the poll EV, one on you know, how can the implementation of international water law be improved, particularly in low income developing countries. Um, there is also this question in terms of what is the best example of a successful international water law uh, agreement, um, and also how how do you ensure transboundary agreements stay active. Um, so I wonder if you might um, address those questions. Okay, thank you very much, Ali. Yes, I, I'll try. Uh, number one, of course, uh, I think from the questions clear, uh, one can say that uh, in, uh, international water needs to be put into practice so that the countries can actually appreciate its benefits. And the countries will decide to cooperate when they see the benefits they are getting on the ground. So my view is that implementation of international water needs to be imp improved by making it help countries to address real challenges on the ground. So low-income countries are really focusing on development. They are, many of the countries are poor. There's a lot of uh, environmental degradation. Food production is very low. So one needs to ensure that international water helps countries to get out of the challenges they are faced with. And once it helps them to address the challenges, they see the benefits of cooperation. They see the benefits they are uh, 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 deriving from working together, certainly they will implement international water law, but they will continue really making it arrive. So my view is we bring international water law to actual on the ground. That's where you can see the benefits. That's where the people are causing these problems are found. And that's where action can be taken to address uh, these challenges. That's what I can say for now. Brilliant, thanks, thanks, Kalist. Um, let me turn now to Dinara, if I may, um, and I, I wonder if you could answer a couple of the questions here. Um, one is uh, sort of linked linked to that the, the previous um, pre submitted questions. It's on enforcement, but specifically on how to enforce equitable and reasonable utilization. This principle of equitable and reasonable utilization. Um, and then the next question is is on um, is that link with domestic law? So, what are the advantages of international water law in water governance compared to to domestic law? So, so I, I know they're slightly different questions, but but um, seeing as you're so fantastic, um, can I ask you to answer both of them? <laughs> Thank you, Alistair. Um, uh, I I will try uh, to. Um, um, I will try to answer in the way that we actually cannot separate international law and national law. I think they're very much interconnected and the more uh, a lot that we hear from the panel today about discussion on human rights, on developments within the states, on ecosystem needs, all these things came from the domestic level. And actually essentially equitable and reasonable utilization all also came from the national legislation. So the development of international law comes from the practice of countries within the state. And I think it's very important to remember when we talk about implementation, it's not like some central world authority impose on countries certain obligation. It just goes back already to the practice of the countries within the national jurisdiction. And I think uh, that's why I don't see the advantages or disadvantages of international water law in comparison to domestic law. They have to play in tandem. And if we want to um, international law operate better, we have to implement all this obligation at national level. And it more and more relates to these future challenges that we just discussed on transboundary waters, 
the future is it's not very optimistic. We have to admit it that the more pressure, more stress, more competition we will have just because of the population growth, just because of the impact of economic growth. And we don't know what would be impact on environment and transboundary from this pandemic. Now, environmental is quite happy that air is getting better because we fly less and we do less economic activities. But we also have less finance to invest in better water infrastructure, in natural system. And so it might have also negative impact on the sustainable water management. And that's why what we have to do to enforce equitable and reasonable utilization, we have to think how better and more efficiently to use water at national level. I think irrespective of what we're talking about on internet, on transboundary water, on water in general, water conservation has to be key in all respect. It, only through the conserving and saving water, we have to ensure more water for the humans, more water for environment, and mitigate the uh, competition between the um, countries and people also. And uh, so first answer would be to look at the national level for implementation. And the second, to enable better procedural system of cooperation. Because as was said, equitable and reasonable utilization is not something that uh, put on stone. It will be changing with the development of the countries, with the changing needs and interests of the countries within the basin. And it always has to be kind of in adaptive mood. And that's why when we have arrangements between the countries, we have to uh, put some provision related to adjustment. We have to be ready to be more adaptable in managing water. And in this way, I think we can manage and enforce these principles in peaceful way. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much, Dinara, um, and, and even linking the question. So um, thank you for that. Um, now, uh, I think that, that's just done an, another round of the panelists and I'll, I'll mix things up a little bit uh, and perhaps turn to, to, to Owen, if I may, um, on this question of, of ex external funders um, and, and impacts. Uh, of, of dams, irrigation, et cetera. So the question is, what is the relationship between the external funders of development, dams, irrigation, et cetera, which have an impact on shared water courses and international water law? Can international water law play a role in ensuring that developments do not have a negative impact? Okay, I think I've unmuted myself. Uh, I'm not quite sure of the of the entire scope of the question, uh, Alistair, but I would have said that one of the key functions of international water law is actually to uh, manage the the impact of such developments, whether you know externally funded or domestically funded. That that would be one of the the uh, absolutely key functions. If we look at, um, you know prominent case law in, in recent years and in, in, in the last couple of decades, uh, it usually involves major projects. You know what I mean? If we think of pulp mills, if we think of the uh, Gabchikova and Ajimaros cases, you know, these involve major, major projects. And the role of international uh, water law is to facilitate communication uh, and such communication to sort of highlight the concerns of, of, of each state increasingly using environmental impact assessment to highlight the concerns of communities and users and uh, you know, um, NGOs and civil society and all these other actors, sub-state actors in respect of such projects. The difficulty with foreign uh, funding is of course investor protection. Uh, and the, the, that will really depend very, very much on the framework that is in place for investor protection under international investment law. So whether there are bilateral investment treaties uh, and it, it, allied with that, what the, the concession agreements actually provide, if you like, you know, so what the, what the, the, uh, the higher level interstate investment treaties provide for in terms of protection and what the uh, concession agreements with the operator of, for example, a hydropower dam uh, agree to. 
Um, and I would argue that that the sort of absolute blanket protection, you know, by means of stability clauses, etc., uh, and umbrella clauses that was uh, enjoyed by overseas investors is less and less and less likely to be to be included in the agreements that govern such investments in the first place. But even where, you know, we're talking about older arrangements and those types of, of blanket protections are provided, I think it's less and less likely that investor state arbitration would provide that kind of absolute protection. You know, all dispute settlement processes, all courts and all tribunals, they're not completely isolated from the, the uh, you know, the, the culture, the climate, the zeitgeist, if you like. And so the importance of environment, of biodiversity values, these, of course, pervade and seep into, into even investor state arbitration. Fantastic. Thank, thanks, Owen. And another example of this, this, this the linkages between different different areas of, of international law. Um, there's uh, I'm conscious of time, but we've got a few more minutes. And but there's one question which is quite high up on the poll, Evie, that we haven't answered. And I, and and I'll ask uh, Dr. Kalist if he might have a go at this one. It's around river basin organisations. So the question is. Are river basin organizations the most efficient mechanism for implementation of international water law at a basin level, or what other alternatives could be considered? Uh, thank you very much. M my view is that, of course, we are dealing with the shared water resources, and these resources don't recognize administrative boundaries. So if you have to manage these resources that don't recognize administrative boundaries, then the basin approach, in my view, is the most appropriate. And of course, when we are looking at the basin level, we can also have sub basin level, go to the lowest level where action can be taken. We have had a situation where we're having a management of these shared water resources by countries bilaterally, but oftentimes we get challenges that where well, resources don't recognize those boundaries. So I still maintain that river basin organizations are appropriate but they need to respond to the needs of the countries. Oftentimes, river basin organization forget that they are there for the countries, that they are owned by the countries, and they start doing their own work. Thank you. Great, thanks, thanks for that. Um, okay, so there's, um, I think we've, we've probably got time for, for one more question, and, and perhaps we take the, the last one on, uh, on the poll EV, uh, and I'll ask this to, to Professor Wouters, but how, how do we make international water law more popular? <laughs> That's the perfect question, I love it. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I congratulate uh, GWP for going ahead and having an international water law module. You can see um, by the uptake from around the world how popular it already is. So how much how much more popular do we need to be? Uh, I think the big thing is for me, Ali, and you'll remember the great times we had in Dundee. Let's bring people together. Let's work with Kalis and his team and river basin organizations and stakeholder at all levels and try to make international water law accessible. Um, uh, uh, relevant, um, something that they feel comfortable with. Um, so, you know, the question for me, I mean, it's been such a fantastic session. Uh, and I congratulate once again, GWP for including international water law. So I, I think the key, I think the key here is to look at making it accessible and bringing people together and, you know, maybe um, uh, inviting more people to the party. And then, then maybe we can have an impact. So congratulations, GWP, and I think it's um, important for the panel and for everyone, you know, sitting out their screen today on the Zoom to see what we can do. Spread the word. That's what I'm saying. Spread the word. Thanks, Alan. Fantastic. Thanks, Pat. Um, and that 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 rounds up this part of the session. Um, and and me chairing. I can say thank you so much to the panelists. Um, you've been brilliant. I can say time's up. <laughs> with this which was which was to remind the panelists but they were all brilliant and kept the time so i, I didn't have to use it um 
so I think now I'll hand over to Yumiko. Thank you, Alistair, very much. Uh, and thank you all the panelists for excellent interactions and answers. I think in such a short time, we really condensed a lot of questions and answers. Very, very interesting and useful for everybody. So now, as a wrapping up, I would like to invite all of you to go back to your poll if and to answer some of the question. The first question I would like to ask you uh, in reflecting uh, on what you have heard, he heard in this session now, I'll ask you the same question again. Uh, now, does the world need more international water law? I'm asking the same question. Um, And people are still typing in. So um, now I think maybe um, there are also the absolute number of participants may have changed. So it's not really an absolute, but in terms of the figures, actually, <laughs> interestingly, it's like a less, uh, before it was 82%, now it's 71%. Um, I think perhaps during this discussion also, uh, people may also have realized the importance of both law and also non-legal uh, um, interactions in really uh, bringing the transboundary cooperation forward. So, and we can actually continue this conversation uh, throughout the MOOC and I think Pat will mention that about the discussion forum after this. I would now like to invite you to answer the next question, uh, reflection, reflecting on from this today's session, what do you think that, what did you learn? And this is an open question. Please just type in anything that you think that you have learned from today's session. Wide perspective. Anyone else would like to type in what you have learned? There's so much more to learn. Yes, uh, we have seen so many questions coming. International water law can't sit a dispute. Um, can't see. Yes, importance of really uh, realizing the tandem of international water law and national that was also nicely commented by Dinara. Um, yes, importance of stakeholder engagement is coming up. Uh, yes, this was mentioned and over and over by different panelists. Um, Pat also mentioned the importance of communication. Carlis mentioned about stakeholder, multi-stakeholder platform, importance of that. Um, yes, importance of communities. Uh, yes, uh, some of you saying, yes, we have to work on the implementation. That is so true. Uh, that's the most challenges. Um, I don't need to be a lawyer to interact meaningfully with international water law. That's a really, really encouragement a statement by the participants. And I'm very happy to hear that you, some of you may felt that you're encouraged to really be confident and utilize the law as it's, it's not only for the lawyers, it's for everybody. Uh, we need better international water law observed by all stakeholders. Uh, yes, that is true. Um, and also importance of taking into consideration the, the real needs uh, from the countries and are on the ground. And it is, has tailored, this is, one comment I see here is the international water law needs to be tailored to the needs of the country. And, and this is also what I also observe in my experience working with the GWP when we do these trainings and also the courses, what people value as much as learning the principles of international law, how that has been implemented on the ground. And on that note, I would like to also uh, emphasize the importance of the peer-to-peer -peer learning. Um, Yes, so thank you so much for that. I would like to ask you your final question. Uh, what uh, would you like to see in the next interactive session? So 
sorry, I say what they, what this is me, actually you. What, what would you like to see if we are to do another session uh, like today's? Uh, what would you like to see? Please, uh, this is a, again another open question. If you could just type your answer directly. More participants to talk. Yes, thank you very much for that. Uh, we will look into what we could be done. Um, and we did use this poll leave as a tool, but yes, I do agree. This doesn't allow you to actually speak. And it is also a challenge with the time management. Um, impact story of the way a transboundary corporation worked well. That's very interesting. Uh, that's definitely a, a great idea to bring some case studies and so on. A collection of teaching resources and tools. Uh, yes, that's also uh, something that uh, I hope the MOOC can change. Uh, cases, uh, case studies discussing implementation of international water law. Yes, with example. So I see people really wanting to hear some example of concrete cases. Uh, also the groundwater, yes. Let us also look into that, uh, uh, um, highlighting the importance of the groundwater. And as you know, in the MOOC, we have in the International Water Law module, we do have a case study by Francesco Sindico on the groundwater. And also in the module five on the tools, there is a section dedicated on conjunctive management. So you will also learn that from those. So thank you very much. Uh, we'll take these things into uh, a, a consideration in planning ahead into the next sessions to come ahead. So thank you very much for that. Um, now, before we make the final remarks, I would like to now invite all of you to turn on your video so we can take the group photos. Uh, and then I think if you make your uh, browser into gallery view, you can see all the participants. And of course, if you do not want to be seen, uh, we do respect your privacy. Uh, we will be, and we may be using some of these photos into our website and promotional materials. So yes, we're not forcing you any, anything, but uh, please, uh, see many of you. Uh, so perhaps I can uh, suggest everybody to wave to the camera. So we see this friendly audience. <laughs> very, very nice to see all of you um, face to face. We, we need to go page by page in taking the photo. So just please uh, stay, keep smiling like an actor and actress in front of the cameras. <laughs> Very nice. Okay. Yes, the photo shoot is done. Thank you. Thank you so much for this cooperation. Uh, I would like to now hand over to Alistair to give a, a, a last remark and then Pat Pat. Please, Alistair. Thanks, Yumiko. I, I won't say much, I've, I've, I've said it before. I think just, just thanks again to the, to the panelists um, and thanks a lot to the, to the participants. Um, sorry, we didn't manage to get through all the questions. Hopefully, at least through the um, poll EV um, voting system, we. We, we, we covered the most pressing questions, but I appreciate that there were, there were a lot more um, that we didn't have a chance to, to cover, um, but, but I hope we'll have more opportunities to do that future sessions or through the MOOC um, and the discussion forum there. You're very welcome to, to, to post your, your comments and questions. Um, and also um, you can um, you can certainly um, contact us uh, directly. So so just a, a huge thanks um, to everyone um, for for participating, and I hope this will be um, uh, the start of um, many more uh, similar sessions to come. Thank you. 
you, Alistair and pa Pat. Would you like to say your uh, final words? Yes, indeed. I think we've got a couple of slides too, I guess, to share screen with. I don't know how if those are going to come up, Yumiko, from your side. It's coming. Coming, fantastic. Well, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Yumiko and Professor Ali. That was fantastic. And, and the panelists, I just loved it. <laughs> so uh, before I start, um, I want to, uh, I've been invited by DWP um, to say a bit about our International Water Law Academy. Um, but before we start that, I, you know, I know you're all out there and I, I really, um, when Ali, Yumika and I were talking about how to, to prepare this, we really wanted it to be interactive. So I want you, even if nobody can see you, I have a question. How many people have found that 2020 has been a really challenging year? Like, put up your hand, right? Even if you're home, put up your hand. <laughs> I mean, how many people think that, you know, wow, international law sure has a lot to answer for, like, uh, what's happened with international law between uh, nation states, uh, with the pandemic, what happened to global responses, and then what's happened, you know, like Professor Kong said, you know, how, there are so many new challenges under the SDG, so much for international law to answer to, so much for international water law to answer to. Danara was talking about all of these added pressures on water. So with that background, I'm suggesting that the International Water Law Academy in Wuhan is really a welcome anecdote to some of these uh, current difficult uh, challenges. It's, uh, it was launched as a result of uh, a meeting in Wuhan over a year ago, and it really has, you know, three things. It's an internet, it's a global center. It's going to focus on international law in the broad sense, international law that applies to water, but also as it applies to dispute settlement, law of the sea, I mean, right, sustainable development goals, you name it, we want to talk about it. And we hope to have the launch in September 2021, but this is the context. The context is, my gosh, isn't the world like a, a difficult place? So we want to have a meeting place. I'd like to invite all of you to come and join the party uh, to see how we develop new communities to address some of these difficult issues, how we find a, a platform for common communication, how we can share, you know, horizontally and vertically vertically, all of the issues that many of you have identified today come together and how we can really build better cooperation. It will be a home for everyone. So I invite you and Professor Kong invites my, my counterpart and partner invites you to come to Wuhan, um, to the academy to see how we can come together to address some of these problems. Next slide, please. So the next slide, this is the really exciting part. Um, we have uh, we've discussed with Yumiko and Ali how we can build on what we started today. And what we started today really is this conversation about making international water law more accessible, about building a global community. And so we're really fortunate to have Professor Otto Schweikers, who is a professional of international law at Wuhan, who is now in China and has taught for years uh, at CBOS uh, at Wuhan, has got a background in international water law and is great at building communities, has been involved with moot courts, law of the sea expertise, and has published a great deal. We also have Dr. David, <coughs> who is a former student of mine uh, from Shaman, a PhD from Shaman. His new book is coming out. He's published his monograph on reciprocity and uh, regional China practice. So Otto, Professor Otto and Dr. David have agreed to support an interactive discussion forum supporting the GWP International Water Law MOOC. So the follow -up, they've come up with a follow-up discussion, the discussion forum, um, a new discussion section has been opened up in module three on international water law because we want to make it interactive. And this is a question. Does the world need more international water law? How can we make international water law more effective in transboundary basins where we live and work? So the discussion forum will be headed up by uh, Professor Otto and Dr. David, and they will have a closer look from October 28th to November 11th. So we need your feedback. We want to know what you want. 
how you want to hear it, and then we will be responsive from Wuhan as the institutional host for the International Water Law Module to see how we can interact better with you and address some of these great big problems that's happening all around us. It's been wonderful. Thank you very much, Dr. Yumiko, and thank you, Professor Ali, and I hand it over to you. Thank you, Otto, and thank you, David. I'll see you in Wuhan. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pat, for that. Uh, it was really excellent uh, uh, wrap up and also introduction of the Wuhan International Water Law Academy. And we are very pleased that you have all joined us to the MOOC as a module coordinator to really help implementation of this MOOC. And as you have uh, as, as introduced just now, uh, as you know, we so many comments that you didn't have the opportunity to raise your voices. If you have any remaining questions or additional questions, please log into the MOOC platform and go to the discussion forum on the module three. We have added this new question on the top of the discussion forum, precisely what uh, just now Professor Wouters has uh, mentioned, uh, following up from discussion. And for the next two weeks, uh, two gentlemen will be, um, uh, actively monitoring and responding to your questions. Um, I will also receive some uh, questions in the chat. Uh, what can we expect more follow-up course from this MOOC? And uh, also about the, you know, whether it's gonna be a recording. Yes, we are going to actually post a recording of this today's event into the MOOC platform. So if you want to listen again, or if you wanna tell your friends that what, you know, what you have heard, please uh, just inform them about the MOOC and go to uh, the platform to see the recording. And um, the, yes, the, we, we, as a way to really enhance the learning and to take you to a next step of really advanced understanding. We, this is why we are precisely doing this this approach of the peer-to-peer -peer learning. As you have seen in the reflections, we really implementation of the international water law, you really need to see how that can be implemented on the ground. And we have actually, through this MOOC discussion forum, we are hoping that people coming to the course will be exchanging between each other on how actual practice happens on the ground. GWP is also being fostering this and we continue to do this peer-to-peer -peer -peer learning. Um, particularly now we, are, we have some uh, uh, fo focused activity with uh, Pan-Africa level training to really continue this peer-to-peer -peer learning among the alumni of this training, which we will be having a session actually on the 18th of November. And so that's more to come. And uh, we've also been doing this international water law and governance training in Asia and in Latin America as well. So that's been an answer to some of the questions that you have raised. Um, the MOOC also does give a certificate that is actually run by the edX, the platform. So uh, unfortunately the platform does have a charges for the certificate, but if you cannot afford, there's also a scholarship you could apply. Um, so, that was another question I received prior to this uh, session. So that's my answer to that matter. So please do uh, join the MOOC. Uh, you see the uh, link in the chat. We are also uh, um, promoting a relevant event that is uh, also implemented by partners. So I can tell you already this week, this Friday, uh, um, uh, there's a, a webinar on, on hydro diplomacy organized by Institute for uh, IIT Guwahati in India, where Christina Lab, who is speaking at the International Water Law uh, module in our MOOC, will be presenting. And in the next week, there will be another webinar from the same institute on the dispute settlement, which I think was will be a very much of following uh, um, conversation from this uh, session that would be highlighted by Professor Aaron Wolf and uh, uh, Ms. Zaki Schuber from IHE um, on that. So you can see the link on the chat. So I encourage you to join those existing events that our partners are implementing. Finally, I would also like to answer the last uh, one of another uh, chat question where the, how the GWP want to bring the policy and regulation of international water law to implementation. And that is precisely what we are doing. As you, many of you may know, GWP is currently uh, has a, a new strategy started this year until 2025, where transboundary water is one of the key pillars of our strategy. And with that, we are really trying to 
actually implement projects and interventions on the ground uh, to really help the countries to come together and to promote the cooperation. And we would like to also use this MOOC and this learning tool for those practitioners to interact with each other and learn from each other. So I really hope that you would be now an active participant to this MOOC and let's, let us continue the dialogue beyond this one and a half hour sessions. And I would very much like to thank everybody who participated to today's session and uh, all the panelists and particularly uh, Professor Alistair Reclark and Professor Patricia Wooders for really uh, from designing and, and working together in designing this session and making this such a wonderful event. On that note, I would like to conclude that today's session. Thank you very much to everyone and looking forward to seeing you next time.